let's veer into what you are big into. What would you say is your primary focus in linguistics? We already talked about the the, the categories, right? The syntactician mm-hmm. and the ph- phony. I... Phonologist. Phonologist. Okay, phonology. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, but I imagine even those are entire fields. You've got to have a specialty, right? Yep. Uh, Excellent. Most... Tell me about that. So my specialty um, is looking into pronouns. Um, I look at pronouns, how they behave in both the syntactic system and the phonological system, and whether or not there are factors at work in either one of those spheres that are driving where those things are, where pronouns are pronounced, um, what forms the pronouns take. Um, Another area I work on is tone. Uh, So some languages actually use variations in pitch to convey meaning of a word. A classic example is Chinese, how, you know, there's one syllable, ma, spoken in with five different pitches, um, conveys five different words. And so that's another area that I study. Um, Third area is something known as the syntax prosody interface. So how the syntactic structure, um, because there's these mental trees in our head, Um, how those correspond to spoken categories uh, that we call phonological categories. Okay. I'll claim that I understood about half of that. (laughs) Yeah, Uh, it was a lot. I'm sorry. (laughs) If anyone questions me on it, you you back me up and say that I understood at least half of it. Um, Yes. And, and I, I knew that when we brought on a specialist that there'd be some of that. Um, but uh, I want to bring it back to the pronouns just a little bit. Mm-hmm. Now, that there's something that I have noticed with various languages because I, I love languages, right? Mm-hmm. love hearing about them, love learning about them. Uh, and so I'm a huge fan of languages. Uh, it's why I just light up when I heard I could talk to a linguist. Um, <laughs> One thing I've noticed is that, you know, you, you were talking about pronouns. Most languages that I know about, they're almost always, at least the uh, the first person is always just like a single sound. Mm-hmm. Is that widespread or does that just happen to be the ones that I ran into? So it could just be the ones that you ran into. Um, I know there are some cases where um, – the pronoun you're referring to is the first person singular. So I in English, um, there are a few cases where it is, um, larger, uh, than just a single sound. Um, but I can't remember them off the top of my head. Um, I mostly focus on the way pronouns behave in a few different languages. Well, a few different language families. Now, we already discussed that linguists are not the people who know all the languages, but does it help to, to have one or two languages under your belt? It does. It helps out a lot. Um, so, for example, I speak English and German, um, and I also studied Old Norse or Old Icelandic, depending on who you ask. Um, and I also study um, indigenous language in Oaxaca, Mexico called Zapotec. Um, And so I kind of focus my study on the Germanic family. So uh, German, English, Icelandic, uh, Scandinavian languages, German. Um, And then I also do a lot of work with Celtic and the languages of Mesoamerica. Okay. Well, to me, that seems like a whole heck of a lot. Uh, Now, I, I've, I've never heard of Zapotec before. How many, how many speakers are there of that language? Is this one of the dying ones or just one that I haven't run across? So when we say Zapotec, um, there's actually 50 different Zapotec languages. So this is a language family? Yes or... and no. It's, it's, called, it's a macro language. Um, so you could think of Zapotec similar to like What's a good example of this? Um, 
So, okay. So I know you speak Russian. Da. So, <laughs> yep. So a good example of what this would be like is if you go from um, Macedonia and you just travel town by town all the way up to M Moscow, as you stop out at those different towns, you're going to hear different versions of Slavic. Um, and that's kind of the same thing with Zapotec is there's so much variation, but yet similarities that it's kind of one family, but well, one language with 50 sub languages. Now, help me understand here. And I realize that I may not even understand the answer, but when we say language, sub language and dialect, mm -hmm. how, how are those? differentiated in with, with real lingu ling real linguists so that's a very tricky thing to say um you know there's a famous saying by a um, jewish linguist that a language is simply a dialect with an army and a navy um <laughs> I, I i'm going to remember that that, yes. that might be the high point that that was awesome Yep, and I see that my uh, my friend here just put that in there too. Oh, um, perfect! Now, now I have a written record. A language is a dialect with an army and a navy. That's yep. awesome. Yep, it was um, supposedly given at a um, language symposium um, done by, like, the Yiddish Book Center, I believe, is where it was first said, like in the 1950s. But as far as a linguist is go, uh, as far as linguists go the way that we classify a language is something called mutual intelligibility, meaning how easy is it for two speakers to understand one another? Okay. That makes sense. Cause you know, I, I speak Russian, uh, but I spent time in Ukraine and when someone's speaking Ukrainian, I can almost understand them, right? I can pick out words and if they're speaking slow enough, I, I can get their meaning. Right? Mm -hmm. I couldn't follow like detailed instructions, but I could get the general gist of what they're saying. Right. Uh, exactly. So would those be considered, uh, again, according to a linguist, right? Uh, in that country, they're definitely considered two different languages. But would right. those be considered dialects of one macro language or so how, they how would a linguist be, classify that? So we, we tend to like to use the term um, variety, language variety, as a way to avoid the stigma that comes with the term dialect um, and stuff like that. But what we do know is that if you look at the standard language, so the language that's taught in school, they are different, um, different languages. But if you go again, village by village, you'll find that you're slowly shifting from Russian to U Ukrainian. And then at the far extreme points, that's where you have trouble. But so, in the middle is just like this huge mismatch of something that we call a dialect continuum. Okay. Uh, I have to ask, because you referred to the stigma of dialect. I'm actually not aware of much of a stigma behind the word dialect. Uh, is, is there a stigma associated with dialects? Yes. Um, this is especially common among indigenous languages. Um, these you know, colonial powers uh, during the age of colonization would go in and call these languages that are very, very unique dialects as a way to disparage its use. So for example, you know, I'm, I was born in Utah and you were too. And there's a stigma associated with the Utah dialect, we could say. And that if someone says, oh, you speak Utah, it's usually derogatory um, in some way. And it's like, oh, you should be speaking proper English. It's like, well, I, it's, proper, <laughs> it's like, well, it's proper for the variety I speak it may not be proper according to the standardized form, but, but there's, it's a way to um, degrade, dehumanize these populations. And it's especially prevalent in these vast colonial empires 
wow russia uh for example a lot of the russian speaking areas the indigenous languages are called dialects um, as a way to minimize the value of these languages you see that also here in yep and as my friend said there's nothing superior about standard varieties at all it's just a weird fluke that happened one one variety just happened to become more popular but like in mexico for example if you call a lot of these indigenous languages that have been spoken there for tens of thousands of years are called dialects or dialecto and it's a very negative connotation and people are made fun of for speaking these indigenous languages that quite frankly have been here a heck of a lot longer than Spanish has. Oh man. I, I, I had never considered the, the socioeconomic political ramifications of dialects. I just thought they were, mm -hmm. yeah, more like variations uh, on a theme. I hadn't thought about them being a lesser thing. Yeah, at least that's that's how people use it um, in okay. a lot of these communities as a way to degrade these languages. And because of that, these languages are disappearing. Okay, so teach, educate us. So we, we don't say dialects. Is bad. Yep. What what do we say? Do we say varieties or mm -hmm. sub-languages? I, I would just say varieties. Language varieties, I think, would be. Variety. So not a dialect of Russian, but a variety of Russian. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, people in this village, they speak a variety of Russian that is largely influenced by their proximity to you, you know, to the Ukrainian center of culture. Right. For instance. Exactly. Because right, I've been thinking about a town called Sumi that I visited, and they speak with such a strong Ukrainian accent. That it was very difficult for me to understand them in the beginning. But now I see that as a linguistic variety mm -hmm. of Russian. Am I, am I, am I getting there? Yeah, you're getting there. Excellent. Excellent. Proud of myself. <laughs>